In the holy name of Jesus, amen. The fishermen, these disciples, were quite astute. They had prepared their boat for a place of quiet contemplation and for respite. Earlier in the same day, according to St. Matthew, Christ had healed the leper and he had healed the centurion servant. We heard that just last week. He continued teaching and healing throughout the day and into the evening. Peter's mother-in-law was healed of her fever. Demons were sent out. He told the dead to go and bury their dead. They were told that there would be no rest for Jesus. There were too many sick, too many lepers, all in all, too tired. And so they were all quite ready to rest after what was undoubtedly a long day. So one of Peter's fishing boats would do well to avoid the pressing crowd that seemed to find Jesus no matter where he was, as he needed to get that much, well, much needed shut eye. The boat would be the best place. Maybe it's really the only place. Water is an escape. How many men say, honey, I'm going fishing just to avoid <laughs> the rest of life? Water is calm. And so a peaceful cruise through the night, that's just the ticket. When Jesus got into the boat, his disciples followed him for rest and calm, <laughs> finally. But as we know, water is not always calm. Sometimes water is good, and other times water seeks to kill. Behold, there arose a great storm on the sea. Now this is no ordinary storm. St. Matthew is careful to call it a seismos. That is an earthquake-induced storm, a tsunami. No wonder it was so sudden. No wonder they were so underprepared. It isn't a casual storm that's predictable or tolerable, but it's that crazy, unannounced, destructive kind. The boat was being swamped by the waves. Matthew is conveying this storm as being a kind of wicked beast that rises up from the deep seeking destruction and death. Great waves crashing upon the boat, even seeking to break it apart. A horrible monster, torment of waves and wind unleashed on these weak fishermen. And then the turning point, or the startling thing, is that <laughs> Jesus was asleep. He's sleeping. Well, of course, it's been a busy day, after all. <laughs> He's like a newborn baby who can sleep through quite anything. Even this seismos, this earthquake, tsunami, and panic disciples. He's not a care in the world. He's like Rip Van Winkle or like someone after a few too many drinks. But there's really no excuse for this savior of the world to go down with the ship to the bottom of the sea, along with his disciples, later apostles, going down after him. That would be the tragic end to the hope of all mankind. The greatest story ever told wouldn't be all that great after all. And so, for that reason, impending doom seized the disciples. They went to the Lord and they said to him, Lord, don't you care that we are perishing? <laughs> Save us, Lord, actually, we are perishing. Now, that's a sort of faith, isn't it? They trust that the Lord should care for them in the midst of this storm, that he could save them. They believe he can and will rescue him from this beastly seismos that's attacking them. Well, not quite. The disciples trust him, but they doubt that the Lord will save them unless, unless he's awake. But faith in the Lord is actually bigger than that. Faith isn't motivated by our doubts, our fears, and our worries. Faith doesn't limit God in the way that he has promised to work. 
Nor does faith only run to Jesus in panic, at times of worry. True faith trusts in God in all circumstances, even when it seems that what we're experiencing is quite the opposite of what we would expect our God to give us. Even when evidence is lacking, trust in his word of promise, that's true faith. And even on that day, as the wind and the waves and the rickety old boat seeks to break apart, true faith would have nothing to fear, for the Lord is with them. You see, your captain Jesus isn't worried. His eyes may be shut, but his divine omniscience sees the whole situation. And so, (laughs) being startled awake, Jesus is a bit grouchy with his disciples. Now you spend the whole day healing and casting out demons and the like. You have your head just hit the pillow, hit that moment of REM, that deep sleep, and then have your disciples come and harass you over something that you know you've got quite well under control. It's kind of like when mom's nap is interrupted by the child asking some silly question like, what's for dinner? Now the child is in a panic, of course, true panic. Wonders if this might be the time that mom finally sleeps through dinner and forgets to provide for her children. This might be getting a little too close to home, anyway. So they wake mom up, and no wonder then she'd be a bit of a grouch. But perhaps she just holds her tongue and gently rebukes the child. Don't worry, dinner will be ready. And I think that's the nature more of what Jesus says to his disciples today. He says to them, why are you afraid, O you of little faith? See, faith isn't just trusting in the Lord when it's obvious, when things seem to be going well. They'd seen obvious things that create faith, miracles, for example. They'd seen that all day. Today, it's as if Jesus wants to say to them, how about a little trust that you're okay even when it seems you're not? Even when it seems that I'm sleeping? Yes, my flesh is weak, but my spirit is quite willing. Do not doubt. I care for you. I will always care for you. Even when all you hear is loud snoring from the bow of the boat. You see, we probably can hear ourselves in this text. We have the same sort of spiritual failing as the disciples. So Jesus says the same words to us. Why are you afraid? Oh, you of little faith. Think back. Think back, oh, you of little faith. I safely delivered you from your mother's womb through the waters of baptism. Or think further back. I brought rain upon my people in the drought-parched land when Elijah prayed to me. Or I led your ancient fathers from exile in Egypt, just as I promised, through the depths of the Red Sea, made dry. I led you through the desert, faithful to you even when you were not faithful to me some 40 years, giving you water and food, even after your anxious father struck this rock with his staff twice. Or maybe today you heard, think of Jonah. Oh, you of little faith. Really one of little faith. The doubter who was cast into the sea. His weakness of faith actually was the result, was the cause of that great storm that came upon them. Scriptures tell us the tempest would destroy them. Rightful trust came in this moment of panic. I, the Lord, gave Jonah charge to Nineveh, and he refused. He disobeyed. And for that, he really deserved more than just that silly storm. He deserved death. But I was merciful. And I brought him to repentance. The great fish preserved him from the water until he would preach to the heathen. There's more. Think back, oh, you have little faith of times with boats and water. Think of Noah and his wife, his sons and their wives, eight souls in all, and the animals in pairs of unclean and seven pairs of clean. Think about how they did not need to fear the rising waters, fear rain, which they had never seen before, but merely trust. 
Think about how they entered into the place of my protection, which I had given them knowledge of and given Noah and his family to build. Think about how they trusted in faith in my command, despite all the appearances, despite how the way all the nations around them ridiculed them for getting into a boat, of all things, despite of the suggestion that an ark of that magnitude would be necessary. Why are you afraid? Oh, you have little faith. Do you see? We don't actually have reason to doubt the Lord's providential care. Your faith is this, that you trust his word and so you can live free and clear of worry. You believe that the Lord is never sleeping. He's always vigilant, always watching over you, caring for your every need of body and soul. And when you feel afraid, that's not the Lord speaking. That's your doubt, that's your worry, your anxiety. And that's why he sends his messengers to preach to you. That's why he gives you his holy word. So that you would see again and again, to be reminded that he will provide. You don't need to be afraid of the storms, literal or metaphorical. Because the Lord Almighty never tires of caring for his children. His watchful eyes were upon his disciples as they are on us. And then, of course, having heard their complaint, he rose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm, transforming those waters that were terrifying into waters now made safe. The storm sent back into the dungeon deep at the chastisement of its creator. Jesus manifesting, revealing, and epiphanying himself, not just a savior, but as the word that made all things. And that word that made all things, that word that came to save you, is still speaking to you, even now. Now you have followed his voice, not into Peter's boat on that sea, but rather into a different boat, the ark of the holy Christian church. I don't know if you know this, but the center section of the church here is called the nave. That's the ancient word for it, the nave, from which we get navel. It's the center section of the boat. And yes, while we're in this ship, it is tossed to and fro. There are great foes, great seismoses, seeking to destroy this church and all churches. We do struggle against mortal enemies. And it's true, we often grow seasick and weary of the journey. How long, O oh Lord? How long? You are assaulted by the winds of change and by the waves of false doctrine. Just like the tempest tormented Jonah and tempest tortured the disciples. There are earthquakes, maybe yet another financial crisis that will cause a great tempest to roar up against this church, against our school. But the enemies are also within us as we panic over the future, as we worry about the generations that are missing from amongst us. Great monsters of sickness and death can crash upon us at any moment, and upon what we think is a fragile, wooden ship. It is as if it is what St. Paul had said earlier in today's epistle, chapter 8, we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption of sons, the redemption of our bodies. You wait with all creation for relief from the storms of this present life, and it isn't always easy, and there is groaning. And yet that's our flesh. But believe this, you're in the boat, and as long as you're in this boat, you have nothing to fear. Your trust is in the faith handed over to you in the book of prophecy and the Holy Scriptures. Your confidence is in the one who is always with you, who is with you by his word that has been entrusted to you. You are preserved, not through your own effort or strength, but preserved through the faith given to you by the work of the Spirit. You're preserved against all false teaching and against the secularism that surrounds us. 
and even as your own sins torment you. By trust in the Lord who grants forgiveness, you are given a clear conscience and prepared to die without any fear or any regret. So the disciples' response to everything they saw is actually apropos to us. What sort of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? What sort of man is he? I'll tell you. <laughs> he is the author of all life. He is the perfecter of faith. He is the voice that spoke upon the unformed genetic material within your mother's womb and granted you the wonderful breath of life that you now enjoy. He is the preserving voice of the angel of the Lord who led his people out of the pit of exile, who led his people as a pillar of cloud and a pillar of smoke through the desert wastes, who led his people on the height to his holy hill. He is the one whom the women followed in grief to the place of the skull, the one whom they watched to give his life as a ransom for many. He is the one who went into the belly of the earth for three days and three nights. And he is the one who the earthly grave could not hold any more than the fish could hold Jonah, and who spit him out. He is the one whose voice is heeded by the earth, just as it was on that day by the sea. And this is important for you, because you, who once dwelled in the shadow of death, have now by that same voice passed through saving waters of baptism into the protection of his holy church, this ark. And despite everything that surrounds us, unsafe water, wicked, spoiled food, Christ here preserves you through water and food, with precious food, the eternal sacrifice found only in his body and blood. And even as the great serpent himself rises up from the deep and seeks to destroy you and your faith and to destroy this congregation, you know and you believe that the warfare has already ended. The death march is over. That even the great serpent has to heed to the command of the one who died for the sins of the world. The horrible beast, as Luther says, is toothless and powerless to destroy you. He cannot prevail and this ship will be preserved. What sort of man is this, this Jesus, that even the winds and sea obey him? Answer, Jesus is your Lord, your captain, and your preserver. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus, your Lord. Amen.